off. Cecil takes the audio from this. So if I just start the show right now, it'll be cut off. We won't have our insightful, brilliant insights from the first few seconds. And certainly this will be a show filled with those, including... <laughs> Is it crazier to play Odell Beckham or bench Odell Beckham in week 15? That more this week on the couch. Bob Harris, you're at the mountaintop. From the mountaintop, what can you see? <laughs> Is it crazy to bench your first round pick, Odell Beckham? Maybe early second round pick? Uh, we have a thing we like to do here called divorcing the name from the numbers, mm -hmm. right? And, and, and if you're doing that, you probably have a lot of better options. Uh, you know, I do like the matchup this week. I think this is a little, probably the last playable week, right? He goes to Baltimore next game, you know. So um, I'm I'm torn because the matchup is favorable. Uh, in generally speaking, though, no, it's fine to bench him. I'm probably benching him for a, a wide range of options, many of whom we had no idea would be options at this point, but who are right? I mean, right? You know, who are, you know? If you're if I'm sitting here trying to decide between a Cortland Sutton or Odell Beckham, if we were having this conversation in September, we'd be laughing at me. Right. Uh, you know, but now we're not. And, and that's that's always the question for me is, is what are the options? I do think, you know, that offense has been uh, I like, you know, Mary Kay Cabot's reporting in the Plain Dealer Saturday evening dysfunctional. The play calling has been an issue. He's been an issue. I mean, the fact that we're not talking about him having a phenomenal season where but instead we're talking about, you know, more off field, the come get me, you know, all that kind of stuff is an indication of, of what to expect with him at this point in time. He's kind of, you know, I don't want to say he's gone full AB because he has not, but he's halfway there, right? I mean, he's as much right. drama as he is as a production at this point. Right. Well, there's so much to tease apart there. I do think just for the rubber meets the road for fantasy, um, I would take something I feel like you were implying there and go farther with it and just say, um, if, if you were looking for permission to bench Odell Beckham, when we you had him. Yeah, you have it. I mean, uh -huh. with the hernia, and then the offense has been an obstacle. Right. right. Uh, and then, as you say, that kind of creates its own d destiny where Beckham's unhappy. We hear more and more things. So, you know, is he Antonio Brown level? No. But is the fact that this much of what's going on with him is getting to the surface where we see it? That's a bad sign. Right. Uh, and I should stipulate he's not Antonio Brown on or off the field no. at this point. So, no. uh, but, but, I, but I mean, look, I, we're talking about a guy, you know, who's probably at best a, you know, wide receiver three right now. Right. And, uh, you know, if you gave me a choice between him and Jarvis Landry, I'd be playing Jarvis Landry every single time. Of it's course. Not even close. So, yeah. and that's where we're at. I, you know, and, I, but I, I feel better when he has like a favorable matchup or the Browns in general have a favorable matchup. But honestly, if I'm the Cleveland Browns, if I'm Freddie Kitchens, I'm handing the ball to Nick Chubb 30 times yeah. and I'm passing it to Kareem Hunt 10 more. Yes. And that, as that offense should run through and, the backfield and um, David Njoku, right. I mean, so I've been every week, I mean, it's, you know, it's the, the, you know, humorous DFS flow chart is Arizona playing is a tight end across it. Right. You know, but, and last week I wasn't on board with that. I'm not a Vance McDonald guy because nobody should be, but this week, am I a little bit of a David Njoku guy? Sure. Sure. He got out a third of the snaps and it only takes one pass to make him relevant. There's a lot of stuff to tease apart here, Bob. I think you started out with divorce the name from the numbers. Uh, and I think, and that includes the ADP, you know, how the investment, much you, right? The investment. the investment. And also it includes the idea of paying attention and putting the most weight on the most recent data. And it can cut both ways because it's not just um, big names. You're trying to find a way to put them in your lineup. It's names like Darius Slayton or A.J. Brown, as Perry Marson in the chat room is asking about OBJ. And we'll talk about Tyler Lockett, Brown, Slayton, Debo. You know, these players that we didn't dream of depending on um, now just going on that trailing data. And then you mentioned the Cleveland offense. I mentioned the Cleveland offense. Also, you have to be able to tell yourself a story. If you're going to stick your neck out and say a trend's going to reverse, you better tell a damn good story of why it's right. going to reverse <laughs> there, at this there's point. There's good stories here in Cleveland. Uh, right. And on top of that, you know, you know, I've been thinking about this a lot recently is, you know, we're afraid to miss out on the big game, right? right. I know if this is the game I bench him, I'm going to miss out on the big game. And so while you're missing out on the big game that never comes, you're missing out on AJ Brown's big game in Oakland or whoever. So, right. I mean, you know, you just have to, and, and I mean, honestly, we can say, you know, I mean, even just looking at this last weekend, uh, I mean, you know, the volatility of the NFL, the, the degree to which it's a week to week game, 
uh, has never been more apparent. Uh, you know, look no further than the 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 49ers and, and Saints. I mean, we kind of expected a bit of a defensive battle there. Didn't quite get that, right? So, I mean, you know, anything is possible, but I think, you know, we have to accept what players are, and it has nothing to do with the investment we've made. It had nothing to do with the amount of research we did in the offseason. Look, you can set yourself up for success. You make the best decisions. They don't always yield the best possible outcomes, right? That's just how it is. That's why they make the ball a funny shape, so it bounces funny ways. And exactly. Weird things happen, right? So, um, look, we're trying to, you know, we're trying to work the odds and, and, and stay ahead of that curve. But to pretend that we have the, the ability to predict week to week that, yes, the the Saints and 49ers are going to score 8,000 points for us this week is, <laughs> is like, you know, I mean, we have to just we have to deal with those kind of things. And part of this, though, is divorcing the names from the numbers uh, and the uh, the emotion from the investment. Right. The, you know, that's right. part of it. Yeah. It, it, in other words, you know, even the, trying to calculate those odds, we're going on such incomplete information. Look, the the games become more volatile this part in the season. We reach a cruising altitude through October, November, where the games feel like they start to fall mostly right. within a predictable range of outcomes after we've fixed uh, our values of players and offenses and defenses from September. And then all of a sudden it starts to get volatile again. In December, you have teams playing for their coaches or not playing for their coaches, teams playing for playoff spots or playing for nothing, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> I have a whole heading, Bob, under the, on this week's agenda that just says, is fantasy football stupid? <laughs> you know, it, 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 it just, it will just, it will like, why, you know, like, why do we, why do we embrace this idea of like the, the most mercurial time on the schedule is when we put the most on the line or you, you know, it, Bob, I know you, cause you sincerely like me and others in our industry, like you care when someone on Saturday, when you oh, sit God, down yeah. to answer those questions, you're really like, it hurts more uh, to give us, this came up a couple of weeks ago. I can't remember who the guest was. He said, it hurts more to give someone else. I think it was Mike Taglier, of course, cause he's got a big heart. He said, yeah. It hurts more to give someone bad advice than it like start mess up your own lineup. You know, I, I you look, so I, I say this all the time and, and mostly as an excuse for not winning any of my leagues, but <laughs> My job is not winning my leagues. My job is yeah. helping people win their leagues. And the work and effort I put into that, you know, I had a lineup uh, this week with uh, Josh Jacobs and uh, another running back that ended up being a scratch. I just didn't get back to it because I'm doing right. work, right? So right. that's part of the deal. And, and so, um, and I do, I sit here, you've sat here and watched games with me. Uh, I watch games and okay, go, oh God, why did I say that? Everything I say on the radio in the pregame show it's flashing through my head. The 300 questions I answer on Twitter every Saturday, flashing through my head. You know, and I'm mindful of those things while I'm answering the questions too, because you don't want to be too smug or too certain in advance, because you know you're going to feel miserable on Sunday when things don't work out the way that you wanted them to. And especially when you're really big on somebody and you push really hard on somebody that comes up short. But, you know, that's part of the deal. And, uh, and I'm fine with it, but it is it is a factor when you're – I mean, every Sunday when I'm watching games, that's part of what I'm watching is I'm rooting for the guys I touted. Sure, and I am too, and it keeps us entertained. It keeps us uh, immersed and um, absorbed in the games, and it keeps us employed too. Yes. Um, so, you know, that's what we stand up to say, I'll do this, I'll take the weight. But there are these moments of clarity, Bob, during the fantasy playoffs where you say, this is – kind of absurd that it we're is. even claiming to be we were snake oil salesmen or something no, like that no no more absurd though than the nfl itself i mean you know, that's, the whole, that, <laughs> that's, that's where the, we really need to go but today, that's yes. the whole idea of it right i mean it's designed so that in any given week anything can happen right from again the the oblong spheroid mm -hmm. shape of the ball that bounces mm -hmm. funny ways to the you know the overall overarching desire for parity and to keep the games close and keep things even and so look i mean that's Part of the fun, part of the fun is challenging yourself to come up and, and look, it doesn't, for me, I mean, sitting here and dissecting matchups and looking for, you know, smart plays and logical plays, that all matters to me. And, and I love doing it. And I love passing along that information and, and kind of sharing with people, look, if I never had to tell anyone who to play ever again, I'd be the happiest man alive. If I could sit here and tell them how I decided who I think they should right. play, that's what I love. I mean, I there's nothing that brings me more joy than that. You don't get as many opportunities to do that because that's not how the world is built right now. People want an answer either or, you know, I sit on Twitter and I get, you know, this guy or that guy. Well, I tell them this guy or that guy. And at the same time, I'm thinking in the thousand plus words I've sure. written about this on my website would be very helpful to you and deciding this in the future. Yet here they are next week asking this guy or that guy. 
Okay. But, but I mean, I think, you know, from the, from the perspective of trying to, you know, trying to assess the matchups and then watching them totally implode on Sunday, I don't know that it makes it any less relevant what we're trying to do. I mean, it, you know, I think we probably focus on the misfires more than we focus on the 10,000 things we get right every week. That's true. And the reality of it is, Bob, is that you can be right and wrong during the same game. Yep. You can be right and wrong about oh. a player or right then wrong, then right again over the course of a season. We're talking season long analysis. So you don't get too high or too low. And I still think that it, it's hard. What we're really doing here is fo- football, as you're saying, it's very complex. I've always called that the oblong ball factor, too. Right. This is why, by the way, people shouldn't get too hung up about how your fantasy football matchup turns out, like what it turns because it. I know that sometimes it seems absurd that, oh, you know, a two-point return for a special teams defense, I think it costs someone like $900,000 and $960,000 in DFS, Bob. You know, you start, again, it's stupid, right? It's just absurd. But at the same time, that's the oblong ball factor that's in the game, and it draws us in. But mostly, Bob, I think it's it's such a complex, interesting thing, especially when you add in all the -the off-the-field stuff that feeds into it, that it's fascinating. And all of us who are fascinated by it like to interact with each other and kind of see how the game slants through our brain and, you know, size up like, Hey, good, you know, game recognizes game. While you watch this game, this is what it's, this is what's lighting up in your brain, Bob. And what's neat is like you said, I would almost rather just riff about the games and then let people just listen to that. And right. say, Oh, that means I should probably play this player. A, right. That's exactly. So like, you know, I love heavy metal music, right? I can sit here mm-hmm. and uh, I can play it to some degree, but not to the degree that the people who are playing play. But I can assess it and maybe not understand all the theory behind it. I can discuss with people who play that music at a high level, uh, you know, my emotions and my feelings, what mm-hmm. I like about it, what I don't like about it, and, or art or and television or whatever. I mean, we can do this. And, and I kind of think, you know, if you love football, you just love to talk about it and assess it, ponder the possibilities realizing in the end that your ability to control the outcome is zero, zero percent ability to control the outcome. And I think that's one of the things about fantasy that I've always said, look, I'm not calling plays. I'm not, you know, I can't tape somebody's ankle. I can't make lineup decisions for a team. I can't, you know, have no control over game flow. But what I can do is make really good informed decisions going into a game based on the best information possible. And so that's what I try to do is I try to compile the best information possible and, you know, in my writing or uh, my analysis on the radio or on podcasts or here with you. What I'm trying to do is, you know, lay out all the information I can. And there's going to be both sides of the story to the degree possible. If you go to my Twitter feed, always you'll see in my bio, the, the man who knows one side of the story knows neither. I mean, you have to, you know, because everything is, everything does have two possible or a wide range of outcomes as we know. Mm -hmm. But I mean, you know, the, the spectrum is broad of the possible outcomes. So I I think you have to understand that when you're playing the game, when you're in the involved in the hobby. And I think we're, we all understand that probably about three weeks into September because we've served, been served up harsh lessons in, in the wide range of possible outcomes. Humble pie. Yes. Lots of humble pie. Okay. So Mm. we'll we'll get back to some Mm. actual, like where the rubber meets the road advice, but I do want to ask you since you mentioned heavy metal, what player or unit or NFL thing that you get to watch every Sunday makes you feel most like the, the heavy metal is like the best soundtrack for it? Uh, right now it's the Baltimore Ravens. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, because they're doing something cutting edge, right? And so I've talked about this. I'm heavily invested in Lamar Jackson, and we may have talked about this last time I was on. But why did I invest in Lamar Jackson so heavily? I mean, you know, you, I mean, look, you could, and you could get him at a very great, at a great price. And I did, but what was the, the, the thing that caught me, that caught my attention? It was somebody saying something unusual. It was John Harbaugh, who I think it was in August at some point said, yeah, we think this guy's going to change the way the game is played. Why did John Harbaugh say that? Right. You know, that's not an accidental thing he just said, right? I mean, he's not, and he's not given to those kinds of statements. Right. Either. And so it caught my attention. And then when you started doing all the associated trigonometry that goes with this, you see the investment they made in him, the buy-in, not just to him, but beyond him, around him, uh, the, the the associated pieces, the coaching changes that were made. And so you kind of maybe had a little hunch, well, wow, maybe they're going to do something a little different. Now they're doing this thing different. And when I watch them, fast music is playing in my head right. because everything they're doing is fast, right? On offense, especially. And uh, and it just I find it incredibly appealing to see 
uh, maybe part of it is just the willingness to think outside the box by an NFL organization where thinking inside the box is what makes everything tick, right? You yeah. think, you know, everyone does the same things. And, and it's one of the reasons I'm kind of optimistic uh, for the Cardinals who seem to be making I think we may have lost Bob. Sorry, folks. I just had to check my connection there. Someone in the chat room, uh, let me know if you're still alive. And uh, I'll, hopefully we'll we get back to this wonderful, stimulating conversation very soon. Can you read me? Are you there? Maybe we're all gone. Well, as Bob was talking about that in Baltimore, what was coming to my mind, and I know now from checking the YouTube that it's all me. Uh, <laughs> I have to untangle my headphones. Thanks, Jordan Tinsley. Um, but what I'm thinking about always is alignment. And when Bob was waxing poetic about Lamar Jackson and what's going on there, uh, then that made me think, again, we always want to look for that alignment, commitment. Uh, John Harbaugh committing to the strengths of Lamar Jackson, including not being afraid of a quarterback getting hurt if they are running the ball. I think quarterbacks are more at risk of injury in the pocket anyway. So I'll tell you what we'll do while I wait and see if Bob comes back. Special edition, folks, because you're my people in the chat room, our people. And I'm just going to start answering questions from the chat room. Uh, and so feel free to get them in there. No, although I don't, I'm not, I'm not, I don't, if I untangle, I'm more phased by trying to untangle my headphones than leaving them untangled. So, uh, tangled up. So let's go with some questions here and we will riff on that. Bama Bilo comes in right away. Should I be even consider not playing Lamar? I know he's on the uh, injury report right now with a quad. I, I just think you can't put him on the bench. I mean, maybe if your alternative is Deshaun Watson. I don't even know Patrick Mahomes carries that kind of respect at this point. I don't think so. Um, Jordan Tinley says, A.J. Brown, do we trust him? Yes, you trust A.J. Brown. I mean, I don't know how you could put A.J. Brown on your bench right now. I know after what we saw from Denver last week, slicing and dicing Houston, um, I, I just think that we have to look, even though there's a risk with the low volume of the Tennessee pass offense, you see what A.J. Brown could do on any target. And it looks like Bob's going to be back here. Hold on, folks. Hey, All man. right. Hey, I'm on, I can see I'm on my Bob, phone. There we are. My internet totally died. Um, so, uh, oh, man. My motor should be back up in a few minutes, and I'll get back on the big screen. But in the meantime, hello. Yeah. Hello. No, you know, the internet, I'm in New Orleans, so everything here can be spotty. The internet drops out at these random times, and I just feel so lucky that it doesn't happen. Um, okay, Bob. Okay. Well, I'm welcome. talking about the Cardinals, and I was very excited. Yes. And, and what I just followed up on from what you said is that what the Ravens achieve with Lamar Jackson is commitment and alignment. Alignment with his rare skill set and commitment to not being afraid of him getting hurt or otherwise, like you said, doing something somewhat forward-thinking. Like, that's the speed medal. And then I still think of Derrick Henry as like the dun 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 <laughs> dun I think like the evil force is going to come and engulf you and you're going to be in its He's belly. the groove metal, man. He's yeah. The, he's, the Sabbath. He's, the, <laughs> he's the down. Well, take some of your New Orleans brethren there. Yes, yes. Um, okay, let's touch on some of these hot button players. Um, and like we talked about, maybe Bob, give people permission to bench them or not. Okay, so you know we have the reputation, the investment of Russell Wilson and Tyler Lockett, and not just reputation and investment, but you know for a good half of the year, these guys were fine in our lineups, even helping us win. They go to Carolina. That's not scary, but at the same time. It's like the touching the hot stove. Like, when are you going to stop burning yourself? I mean, if you played Tyler Lockett the last month, it hasn't been good. If you played Russell Wilson the last couple of weeks, it hasn't been good. Are you touching the stove again if you have a Seattle Seahawk? Oh, okay. Well, as, as I set that up, thank you, folks, for your... We'll come back, as I think Bob might be um, getting 
There we are. Are you there, Bob? I Can am you read me? Here. So my Seattle are asking me to use cellular data. I am. My, my modem should be back up momentarily. We yeah. Well, and uh, Wilson Lockett. What do we think about them this week against Carolina? I guess Carolina, I'm okay. I, look, I mean, I'm trying not to chase the matchups and get too crazy on this, and, and it hasn't been good. But, look, we know what Russell Wilson can be. Lockett has been a little more disturbing. It's like a three-game, you know, slump that that I think this is a run first off. Maybe I, maybe I just stick with the components here that I know work. And one of them is Carson, Chris Carson, obviously, who's going to work even better. Yes. Because there's less uh, penny to cut into his workload. Look, I've – Talking to someone, uh, you know, on the serious show. Oh, everything's coming back on, Sig. Yeah. Want to let me uh, step back. Go ahead, up? Bob. You, you and remember right. where you were? We were talking about Chris Carson's serious show. Right. Hold that thought, and I'll go ahead and answer some more questions from the chat room while you get things going. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, everybody. As uh, we're here, you know, uh, and, and Zaria says AJ Brown over Devontae Adams. I don't know if I'd go that far. I mean, I still think that part of what happened with the Packers last week was that. They just didn't really need to put the foot on the gas uh, against Chicago and revive Mitchell Trubisky. Maybe they might. Um, and again, there was Perry's question about OBJ, Lockett, pick up AJ Brown, Slayton, or Debo. And I'm going with AJ Brown, um, as as Perry said that. Uh, moving down, looking at uh, uh, Soul Brothers' question: Goff or Ryan? Probably going with Jared Goff here. Not Dallas's defense hit a low. Last week, man, Mitchell Trubisky coming back to life. Matt Ryan, while he did play well last week, some of that was a total breakdown. One that I think even got called out by Jacksonville's defense, the calls. Uh, total breakdown to Olamide Zacchaeus. And uh, and then Curtis, we also saw uh, Calvin Ridley, part of the wide receiver carnage. We'll talk about that later. And Bob is back. Kind of more or less. Okay, I can Dang. see. But I, yes. All right. Oh. Yes, you can see this is one of those moments where, like, how would we feel like a much like a limb was amputated if we really lost the internet forever? So, God, uh, the question I was just asking, just because we we're saying connected, right? We don't need to say Soul Brother ask Goff or Ryan this week. I'm saying Jared Goff against Dallas over Matt Ryan, who just lost Calvin Ridley. Does one of those names pop out as the correct answer to you, Bob? Right, are we, and this is the problem. We go back to Russell Wilson, uh, Jared Goff. Uh, we've seen the yin and yang of their performances, right, in just the last month or so. Um, I'm going to ride the hotter hand. Uh, I think the Cowboys are due for a good game, but I'm not going to bet on that. I think I bet on Goff. This offense working a little better all of a sudden. Maybe it has a maybe it coincides with uh, Sean McVay no longer being an idiot or and giving a little more Todd Gurley run there, but. But whatever the case, I'd be more interested in golf at this point than than Ryan. I know the offensive yeah. line seemed to be a little better in Carolina, but in general, I don't think it's going to improve, you know, markedly over the course of the rest of the season. So I'd probably be leaning a little more on on golf in this one. Um, and go, but going back to Wilson, I mean, I think that one's a harder one because I mean, it was the MVP level play, and now it's just not great. Lockett's not great. I still think he's playable. He extends plays a lot. He creates a lot with his, you know, with his athleticism. I'm probably still playing him, but again, a lot of these situations when we talk about him, it's the options available to you. I will say last week, I mean, you know, looking at the options available to me, you know, Sam Darnold looked pretty appealing. Ryan Fitzpatrick looked pretty appealing. All of a sudden, the Dolphins go from being an 80% red zone team with Ryan Fitzpatrick at the helm to being a 0% red zone team. Maybe Devontae Parker was a bigger issue, a bigger part yes. of that of that scheme yes. than we expected, but Whatever the case, and maybe that's what you look for this week if you're if you're thinking of playing outliers like that is or all the associated pieces there. But I I have a little more faith in Wilson maybe than I do some other quarterbacks just because it's an annual. And look again when we're talking about you know the kind of variance and volatility we see in this game. What do you what do you hang your hat on? Do you hang your hat on hoping to catch a a, a flash in the pan, a, a big moment, another Derek Locke big game, or? Or do you want to count on a guy who, for how many years now, has been a quarterback, top five quarterback for fantasy purposes? Yeah, I think lock over Wilson goes a little bit far, but you know, I'm probably I'm playing Tannehill over Wilson. I'm playing Tannehill over everybody. Yeah, Except right. Lamar Jackson, right? I know, I know. What is what have we learned about Adam Gase, right? Um, uh, we've learned a lot about Adam Gase. He right? is really well. Is what we've learned. I guess so. Um, I'm wary on Wilson. 
here's why, and this might be Bob. This might be me being affected too much by when, the, and maybe so. There's a couple of ways you could spin this that are believable. Because Tyler Lockett, I don't think he meant to throw the offense an offensive coordinator under the bus. Did you see it, Bob? Yeah. What Tyler Lockett said, and he's like, yeah. well, we weren't trying for explosive plays. Right. We, we were just trying to control the ball. Ah, uh, that's not good. That's not good for Wilson's. Out- and, and the thing is, Russell Wilson has been this study in him generating fantasy value against the wishes and conditions his coaches put up around right. him. So, and then last week, he was even behind basically for the entire game. And it's still, now the Rams defense serves some credit here. So a lot of negative things here. And unfortunately, I don't know if we can count on Kyle Allen to turn this into a shootout. Maybe we can hope that Seattle's defense helps turn it into a shootout. So I, I feel like those are some uphill battles there. But I also might be too affected by Tyler Lockett. We've had a lot of those m- revealing moments this year. Right. Look, this, I mean, we know what this offense wants to be. And I mean, you know, and, and it even goes to their commitment to Carson, right? I mean, yeah. you know, all along, whether the fumbles, having Rashad Penny there, whatever. I mean, even go back to last year. I mean, if they can, they want the ball in Chris Carson's hands. And, and the uh, Panthers don't want to stop the the Panthers look like a run, run defense. They're just tired, right? Like they, they just can't do it. They, yeah, I mean they just don't <clears throat> want to either Atlanta run defense. So, it, right. So I th- I talked to uh, D Orlando Ledbetter from the Journal Constitution mm-hmm. last week, and we were talking about this game coming up. You know, and we're saying so. You know, the Falcons have a lot of problems, and and you know they have one problem. Blocking, B-L-O-C-K-I-N-G, that fixes everything. Well, it turns out a really good matchup fixes some of the blocking, too. Right. Uh, although my Brian Hill shares from the first game against <laughs> these teams would suggest this doesn't always work. But, and again, that goes back to what we talked about at the top of the show, right? I mean, we're trying to leverage these matchups. Maybe that's part of the problem, Sig, is, is we are so eager to leverage these matchups that we see, right? Uh, that we go all in and our expectations are so high. And we do the opposite thing, too. Like, we see, okay, this guy has a tough matchup. Okay, it's a tough matchup. It's not like an impenetrable right. matchup. It's not like an unwinnable matchup. Everyone's playing hard. Somebody might make a play. Like, okay, someone's going against Stephon Gilmore. Well, yeah, it's been really tough, but that doesn't mean DeAndre Hopkins still can't make a play, right? He's a really good player, too. And I think we gin up in our head these, you know, these immutable things because yes. we're looking for certainty. We're lacking nuance, Bob, because really, right. I think what we have is where we can aggregate these things and say tough matchup, uh, uh, easy matchup, and we can even say reduce it to the <sighs> previous four weeks and say the trend going into the game is it's a tough matchup or it's an easier matchup. But what we really need to get to is that next level of nuance where we say these kinds of offenses or defenses present problems for this player, for this unit, right. for this attack. These kinds of offenses, defenses, when there's a weakness, like this offense is good at exploiting this kind of weakness, but really bad if the op- opposite defense strength is attacking their weakness, which is this, and really understand how those pieces fit together. I think Warren Sharp does some interesting stuff with this on yes. and play calling, but it, it's also an aggregate level too, because we shouldn't totally ignore matchups. I do think at this time of year, I doubt, I don't let a matchup talk me into playing someone I wouldn't otherwise play. That's how right. I'll put it, but there are meaningful things you can take away from matchups. Like, Miami and wide receivers. Uh, I mean, you know, this week, if, if you want a reason to keep Darius Slayton in your lineup, I think this is one because we saw Robbie Anderson do well. Or Oakland um, and A.J. Brown and how he sliced and diced them. Now, the problem is it's Jacksonville. And Bob, right. Jacksonville has Running. been historically bad right. for the last five weeks. Horrible. Historically Horrible. bad. So I just want to toss open a general question because – I'll make it sound macabre when I'll say, you know, there's all this carnage at wide receiver. There's guys at Atlanta, Tampa, Philly, Jacksonville. I mean, those four come to mind right away that are going to get more playing time. Um, is And this is where it gets macabre, Bob, right? Because I, I feel like this is one of those things like post-apocalyptic, you know, you see like a dead body and you rifle through their pockets. You know what I mean? <laughs> But you know what I'm saying? Like bad things happen to Calvin Ridley and DJ Chark and Mike Evans uh, and uh, Alshon Jeffrey. Are you seeing any opportunity here? Or are you just saying, leave it alone? Let the vultures pick at it. Right. We do tend to go a little Serengeti Plains on some of these things. Yeah. And not just the, the injuries and attrition, but the matchups as well. Like, you know, DeAndre Washington. Oh, against Jacksonville. Ah. 
I mean, it's a can't right. fail matchup, right? It, it can't fail. Well, of course it can, uh, because anything can fail in a good time. But I do think it's, uh, you know, I think we've learned uh, over the time our evolution as fantasy players that these aggressive moves are the things that can often win games or win right. seasons for us. And, you know, maybe DeAndre Washington turns into a guy who's going to win somebody fantasy titles. How many years have we been talking about this on this, on your mm-hmm. pod, mm-hmm. that some some running back, nobody drafted. Uh-oh. I think it just happened again. So, oh. ooh, ooh, ooh. Yeah, we're good. Uh, you froze for a second. We're good. We're back. Oh, okay. Um, but th- but that I think that's the thing. So when you see these injuries and attrition, I mean, I don't know if I want to dive into J- Justin Watson territory, um, mm. Rashad Perriman territory. But right. hell, they throw the ball a hell of a lot there. I mean, and that's where I think we get, you know, we need to start understanding how to select from a range of options. Yeah. Right. Well, and with with those Tampa receivers, we're talking about, well, first of all, is Jameis Winston going to play? So that's important. But assuming he is, it's that Detroit matchup, and it's an offense that is producing, Matt, what, 400-plus passing yards right. just last week, and Indy yep. is not a pushover defense. No. So Watson and Perryman might be better to trawl into than, say, um, Atlanta's receivers against San Francisco, not just count, you know, just counting last week's uh, result, or even Jacksonville. Now, Jacksonville has a good matchup against Oakland, but that team is just morose. You get the feeling, Bob, you know, watching Dallas, watching Jacksonville, and I mean, this is overly simplistic, but that these teams just don't want to play for Tom Coughlin and Jason Garrett. I mean, what- it's, uh, I, I get, I mean, I don't know if it's, if, if, yeah, I guess, I, I guess I do. I don't want to, I mean, you're right. It's, it's kind of oversimplifying, but, but certainly they're not inspired. And right. uh, according to Jalen Ramsey, hell yeah. Uh, they don't <laughs> want to play for Tom Coughlin. But, <laughs> but, uh, um, but yeah, I think that, I think there's something to that. And, you know, you just get to a point in the season where you don't hear the voice anymore. Right. So the right. Marones, the Pat Shermers, uh, you know, the Jason Garrett's, I mean, you know, you, you hear from the people who cover the team on a daily basis, at least in Dallas, that the players still have a lot of respect for Garrett and, you know, don't pin the blame on him. But I think in a, a lot of these cases, you just don't hear the message anymore because it's not working. The the things you're being told uh, don't work out for you in the end. So you start thinking about other possibilities and you start projecting to the next season. I think we're seeing a little of that in Jacksonville. They're playing horrible. Yeah, it's. It, I mean, it's something to that maybe induce you to to a. De- this is all coming back around to like, I yeah, thought, if Josh Jacobs is out, play DeAndre Washington. You and, know, right? And, I, and, and if and, Jacobs yeah. plays, then it's more like it makes you more willing. The potential payoff is better if Jacobs plays because that's a whole other layer too, Bob. There's Jacobs. So are you, if Jacobs is active, if the MRI, if they say go ahead, you can keep playing. You're no danger of like puncturing your lung or something. Uh, you, are you putting Jacobs in because of that matchup? Uh, I'm gonna think. I'm gonna look at my options really carefully. They'll just here. numb it up, Bob. You oh, yeah, know? they do. They have medicine for this. You'll be surprised <laughs> to learn. Um, and they didn't use it last week. You're telling the fact that they're likely out of the playoff picture, essentially, for right. all intents and purposes, probably leads me to that. I, I'm hoping that this, this is one of those decisions you hope is made for you, right? Well, same with, with Connor and Juju. Connor, Juju yeah. Sunday night against Buffalo. Right. So that's another complicating factor. Right. Give them yeah. a week. Like if they go off on your bench, you feel better if you advance to week 16, but you're not dipping your toe in that water. Right. And that's the, you, man, that, that again is to me the biggest problem. We're so worried about either a missing out on a big game or, you know, playing a dud or whatever that, you know, we don't think about all the possibilities and look at all the ranges of outcomes. The quarterback situation. I mean, you know, last week, how many people did not play Drew Brees? Cause that was an impenetrable Ugh. matchup. Yeah. Well, that's Everybody. where the matchup. And that was a strange. I mean, that was a strange game. Sometimes game. watch these games for decades, Bob, and you see that oh. it's um something in the air, right? I mean, it's just the nature of the looseness and what works on offenses makes things get looser and looser. And well, I mean, I'm down here in New Orleans, Bob. Like, there's just some nights, full moon. I don't know what it is, but people do things. Are like, wow, it'll be years before I do anything like that again. I'm glad that I survived <laughs> it. Um, so, you know, but I think that um, you, you don't want to – well, see, it's matchups. So that's the thing. Drew Brees actually had positive momentum. So, but right. while we're riffing on this, a couple of quarterbacks you absolutely drafted to start for your fantasy team that do not have positive momentum right now. Number one, and Ben Fennell, who does fantastic stuff, showed one play that shows where Aaron Rodgers just isn't – he's just not making good decisions. He's 
playing sometimes like a bad quarterback who does the thing that makes you want to tear your – he's doing like Mitchell Trubisky stuff, you know, with the way he's managing the decisions available to him. And it's showing up, Bob. I mean, how many times has he been a good fantasy player? Your five maybe? Yeah. It- as long as the Mitchell Trubisky stuff of the last three weeks, I'm okay with that. But Right, yeah. right. But, but- so, Rogers on your bench this week, though? I mean, even maybe, you know, for somebody like Ryan Fitzpatrick or – I don't know. Uh, I mean, I think I'm not going to go. No, I think I'm not going to get. I'm not going to. So one of the things I try not to do is outsmart myself. Said the guy who benched Drew Brees more than he'd like to admit. Right. But for in some cases, Ryan Fitzpatrick, Ryan Tannehill. I think you know. You look at the the level of play since he's come in. I think he's there. I think there's like four quarterbacks I'd start ahead of him. Right. Right. You know, on the on a, on the regular right now. <clears throat> so. So Rodgers, I think I'm looking at the range of options, but I think also with Rodgers, you take into account, you know, the history and the supporting cast to a degree. He has mm-hmm. Devontae Adams, I think makes it a little easier for me to play him. I think Aaron Jones, if the usage is proper, I think, you know, and the coaching comes into play here. I think Rodgers is a little easier for me to play uh, in the, in a slightly tougher matchup. But I, honestly, I'd rather leverage the real easy matchups because he kills those. Right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's how it's been, and he does not have a real easy matchup. So similarly, and another negative thing here is his hand was real bruised up. Not broken, but bruised up, Patrick. Mahomes, and you haven't had regrets about putting Mahomes on your bench uh, you didn't, if you did it last week against New England because of the matchup. But it wasn't. I don't know if it was the matchup. I think that his game changed after his hand got hurt. But he's also facing a Denver team that's pretty spirited. I, I, Bob, I compared them to like a teenager on a joyride right now. You know, they're just having <laughs> we have fun. Quarterback. We have a quarterback. Yeah, it's like a cur- you were out past curfew and have some fun. And certainly they would love to have some fun against Kansas City. And this is a defense that did give Patrick Mahomes a little sure. bit of trouble last year. But again, are you overthinking it? Well, we could put the break point at Tannehill. I is Tannehill? I mean, he's above Mahomes. Yeah, above Mahomes this week. Pretty, pretty damn close, right? Yeah, I mean, right. So, I mean, if we look at the, the like the week to week scoring, it's been for the most part really good. There's been a couple lousy games. Where, you know, you, the only single digit game was against Denver when he got hurt. Beyond that, I mean, he's only been what below twenty points once or twice. I think this year. I'm happy yeah. to look once. So, I mean, we need to keep it in perspective. But some of this is, you know, what are your expectations for a guy going in? Well, I expect him to throw 50 touchdowns. Well, most of us knew that wasn't going to happen. And so is this really as horrible as it seems? Look, there's been a lot of issues for him, in my estimation. Offensive line has been a big problem for the Chiefs in general. The running game has been a problem. Maybe it turns out that that Kareem Hunt was a, you know, that it's not a plug and play situation, right? That you you maybe need one of the best running backs in the NFL to really excel the late season run by Damian Williams, notwithstanding, you know, I mean, so I think there's, there's pieces, but again, sometimes I'm okay just playing a talented player in a good scheme. Uh, if I don't have a better option, maybe Ryan Tannehill is a better option right now, but I don't think the list is long of better options than Patrick Mahomes. Yeah. It has to be a picture of the player in your head recently. But there is a very simplistic thing that, in some ways, I think drew a lot of us to fantasy football at the beginning, which was this idea of like riding with a player. And it's, you know, you riding with Patrick Mahomes, like your season's on the line. Are you riding with him or are you riding with Ryan Tannehill? And we measure it through stats, but there's still that base level. And there's a part of it that's emotional. Just sure. Who, I mean, who you want to, you know, put the ho- your hopes in. When does Ryan Tannehill turn back into Ryan Tannehill? Right, we know right. that guy. He has shown us who he is. And he's just right. waiting to, uh, like uh, Mike Dempsey, my co-host on Sirius last, I said, you know, you just think in the back of your mind, you can see his hands on the edge of the tablecloth, ready to pull it out mm-hmm. from under you here, right? Mm-hmm. When you start having faith in him. So, right, there's right. That, but look, that's part of the fun of the game too, right? So who do you trust? Do you trust Patrick Mahomes or you do, do you trust Ryan Tannehill? At this point, I mean, if I'm divorcing my investment and my right. emotions and letting go of all the baggage. I'm trusting Tannehill yes. more. It's been higher end. It just has been. And it's been against a wide range of opponents. Maybe some of this is Arthur Smith is getting good at what he does, right? right. His the, the design of his offense. If you look at the numbers for Tannehill uh, in play action, super successful. Well, imagine that. He plays with Derrick Henry, who horrifies opposing defenses. to leverage that aspect. So all the things are working right, and all the pieces aren't working just right for the Chiefs and Patrick Mahomes right now. And it's not hard to you know watch them objectively and say, yeah, this is not quite what we were hoping for. Maybe I can look at a wider range of options. And I think, you know, I'm that I'm trying to be that guy, and I am, except for everyone but 
Lamar Jackson, who I'm totally in yeah. the for. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and that's the Thursday night game. And on the uh, subject of that Thursday yeah. night game, we're going to talk uh, just a couple more individual things. Then we'll go off the rails, Bob. I mean, we're really, you know, we just come back on the rails. Wait, when we're, we already need to, off the rails. we're already off the rails. Oh, we live no. off the rails. Um, so, Bob, I think about like um, when to walk away from the table. You know, sometimes it's the right time to walk away mm-hmm. from the table. I feel like this is the right time to walk away from the table if you've been playing Robbie Anderson. Three good weeks in a row, that's great. But it's Baltimore. It's Thursday night. I don't like it. Uh, but are you going to pick up the dice one more time with him this week? Nope. No, I'm not. Uh, look, so again, I don't want to, you know, start pretending matchups are unbeatable, unwinnable. Uh, but that's right. a good secondary, right? That's a good. I mean, just like the Jets are a good run defense. I don't need to tempt fate with that either. You know, a good Joe Mixon performance, notwithstanding. Generally speaking, that's a good matchup. If I have options in that range, I'm gonna look elsewhere. The thing about wide receiver is there's a ton of options in that range, right? There's a lot of guys I can play. So yeah, I'm going to examine that carefully and I'm not going to force, I'm not forcing Robbie Anderson into any lineups. I think is, you know, the, the overall play of that offense to this, to date. I mean, well, you know, the best thing you could say about it is it's been horribly inconsistent. <laughs> right. Well, and not even, he can't even map it to good matchups or bad matchups. No. Or like that. Uh, Adam Gase again, Adam Gase always present. It's, again, Gase is a, I mean, I gotta. I I need to dig deeper into this to figure out how he does this because, man, he. You know, again, a lot of a lot of people who know a lot about football think and who are close with Peyton Manning, for example, you know, vouch for this guy, and uh, everything I've seen tells me that's crazy. Maybe it's just that they're starstruck by Peyton Manning. You know, like when he picks up when he picks up the phone, he's like, Mister Johnson, (laughs) Mister. Adam Gase is upstanding, you know, like, and they're just like, wow, Peyton Manning called me. Like, if you want to throw the ball around sometime, or I can't even do a Peyton Manning impression. The, the evidence we have seen uh, dating back to how long ago suggests that anyone who's, like, vouching for him is making a bad mistake. Well, it's not a meritocracy. Like, all these things, Bob, I want to file under. There's a gigantic folder. It's not even a folder. It's a file cabinet. It's, so, it's a row of file cabinets, and it, all, all the heading is it's not a meritocracy. So let's go off the rails right now. So yeah. here we have here we have a, a situation where you know like there's been some he's had some he had some success once. This is like where NFL owners are like fantasy owners. They they're chasing <laughs> these points, right? They're chasing this production when really what they should be doing. And I know it's painful, and for many of these owners, it's even more painful because they're a hundred years old and they're going to die soon, and they want to win before they go, and so they're chasing this this flavor of the day. Um, I mean, think about how many people, I think Jeff Manns, my co-host on Sirius on Sunday, mentioned this on his Twitter. How many coaches got jobs because they know Sean McVay? And what is Sean McVay doing this year that's so damn smart? And how do all those owners who ho- hired Sean McVay protégés feel about Sean McVay and those protégés right now? I mean, granted, Green Bay's having some success, but in Cincinnati, you know, were they just chasing, uh, you know, uh, uh, not even a, a tangible a thing? A fad, right? So when I look at the coaching hires from last year, I look at the one that's probably been among the least successful in terms of wins and losses, uh, Miami hiring Brian Flores. And I look at that hiring because they went to an organization that wins year in, year out. And they took a key piece of that. And they didn't put an expectation on that, hey, boom, we're going to be a thousand percent better. They took the opposite approach. So the expectations were low. Uh, They took someone from a winning culture and they, I looks like to me, they've asked him to build a winning culture right. from scratch. I think that's probably the best way to do it. I don't know if that's a really a, a viable way to do uh, anything anymore in the world is to <laughs> sit down and build it from scratch because I don't think right. anyone has that kind of patience. But no. that's the way to do it, and I, and I hope that he, I hope he has success quickly, so other people are enough success quickly, so that other teams start emulating that and doing it more. Because I mean, look at the, you know, we'll talk about the Patriots here, I'm sure, but the Patriots, the Steelers, you know, the, you look at teams where there's stability and you see that long term success, and then you look at the Cleveland Browns, for example, where you know every year is a new coach and every year is the same problems, and I, I just, I would hope that teams would see this at some point now. Of course, someone would argue with me, well, well, Marvin Lewis was the head coach of the Bengals for 500 years, and they made zero playoffs, right? But, but still, I think there is something to be said for stability at these, at, these, uh, at these positions. Stability, continuity, the program. And like you said, it sounds like really they hired Flores for the job of for a full rebuild and right. not, not to you know, pizzazz it up 
for the short term. And he's certainly the team is improving and they're playing with a, the worst roster in the league. Right. So they're really a well coached team, honestly. Uh, although although the Giants of Monday night second half tell me that they're making a strong push for this. And yeah. they're much and they're much more poorly coached. <laughs> it's true. It's true. Although I highly encourage you, Bob, if you haven't to read Zach, read Zach Rosenblatt's story about when Dave Gettleman was a, a driver's ed teacher in high school, Mr. G, they would call him. He's, it's going to surprise you. It's a good one. Look it up. It'll, it'll right. warm your heart. Of course, Bob, because I want to start the revolution. One of the things that I think about while you say that is maybe these billionaires that own teams aren't brilliant the tacticians, the strategic thinkers that they're made out to be. Maybe, you know, it's like wanting to like the things it takes to win business deals and things like that and know how to rapaciously like to destroy and mass wealth aren't necessarily like sound management or sound like being a people person and having people skills. And that's what some of this stuff gets to so that they do get taken in by fads or otherwise um, don't, they do get taken in by the things that, uh, fantasy owners that fail do, you know, chasing something that wasn't even real in the first place. And it's, again, it's not a meritocracy. <laughs> right. Not a meritocracy. So, like, but, but it kind of, it kind of is and isn't. I mean, David Tepper is going to find out that, you know, stability probably would have been better for him than the flip, but, but maybe he knows that already because he's a part owner of the Steelers for a, right. a long time. Maybe, maybe he has a better understanding of that. And just, you know, when you spend $3 billion on a team, you want to put your people in. I get that too. I mean, but I, I just hope it's, it's done in a, in a, in a, in a good way. Well, we can say this, Bob, um, Arthur blank, I think had a big moment early in his tenure as the owner of Atlanta, where he realized that he needed to take a step back. Yeah. Um, Steve Biscotti, the Ravens, yep. we were just, he took a step. He learned really quickly to take a step back. Right. Like he learned, I think maybe in the first year or two of owning that team, like just let the people that you pick, do their job and trust them. Uh, and that's important. Um, so, you know, there it's, it's tough yeah. though. Cause you and I can't even trust the guys we drafted for nothing. Right. In our draft. Right. So, I mean, I get, I get the issue, but it is, I, I think it is uh, something that I think that is a good point. You look at some of the ownership, I, you know, I know Robert Kraft is pretty prominent, um, mm -hmm. but he, you know, I don't think he, I don't see him, making final decisions unless it's Antonio Brown. Um, I don't see, you know, I mean, I, I just think you're right. I think the good owners probably lean back a little bit. And I know this feels like I'm taking a shot at Jerry Jones. And I, exactly. I don't know. I don't, I don't know that that's really what I'm doing. I think he's learned a lot about football, but I don't think he's learned the most important thing, which is what you just said. Yeah. And I mean, you even hear him throw his weight around sometimes, you know, I get to make the decisions, but bad organizations with bad owners stay bad. Like, Cleveland, Washington. I think the Jets you have to really question right now. The Dolphins we might have questioned. We'll see. But the, the, maybe that true delegation finally happened. Okay, we talked about that. Let's just go there with the Patriots. Because I feel like I've been emotionally skewed here, Bob. I actually enjoyed the Patriots dynasty and basically saw what they were doing. I mean, it's football. Uh, there's holding on every play. You know, if you're not cheating, it's America. It's the most American sport. If you're not cheating, you don't want, but you don't want to win bad enough. Going back to the billionaire point, like the most important thing is wanting it so bad. Like I can't even live with the idea of not having it winning. So, you, so in some ways when the Patriots were discovered doing this or that, or people, uh, were accusing them of this or that, I would just kind of laugh it off and say, well, you know, every team is the Astros and the s signal stealing also has come up. That's a whole other layer but the two stories intersect bob but the antonio brown moment i felt like was the peak of the belichick arrogance to say like basically i can manipulate events to my benefit and nobody can stop me and i that was where it turned and some of it's my old steelers you know i mean I'm, the steelers have rekindled my love of the team through their defense through them being humble not playing down to competition having hunger so i look at what happened recently and i might not be the most unbiased person to talk about it but i know bob that you are sage and you have that stillness like a pond that <laughs> reflects everything perfectly what do you think how's this slant through your brain what's going on with the patriots and the Bengals and videotaping so uh, i think number one the patriots when you have that history you have to know better right 
you have to you just have to i mean i you know and i thought their statement you know to be fair their statement said hey it's us uh, we are responsible for what happened and, and you know and i mean there's so what i don't like about this is this is going to turn into the biggest thing of the season where there was a lot of great things in the season from Lamar it's probably Jackson. not though the nfl is doing a pretty good job probably going to tamp this out by friday we're not even going to be talking about well it. we'll see we'll see about that we'll see if espn has some say in that um <laughs> well adam schefter <laughs> seemed to be i don't want to say he was carrying water for the patriots but he was his statement was a very patriot it's you know bob we're in the post well, maybe they world. feel they owe for chris morris's reporting on inflake right right <laughs> no um, it's so true we have the athletic, the Cincinnati beat writer, I think Diana Rossini, who also, is she ESPN too? So, you yeah. know, I guess we can't yeah. boil it down to outlets because right. we're getting both. And and this is, there's a whole other side of this, Bob, that's the post through society. And it's like this new quantum physics where as soon as an event happens, it splits into matter right. and antimatter. Exactly. And neither of them are actually the event. Yeah. But right. just based on your your allegiances or something, you pick Everything. one or the other, even though not, it's like I compare it to jury trials where like the prosecution and the defense both present something wildly inaccurate, but they're just trying to get you to pick theirs over right. the other one. It, it's our, and like, honestly, the first story out is going to be the story that sticks because that's the one everyone remembers. And it doesn't matter how much nuance or fact or whatever comes out, but it's a reflection of our entire society that, you know, I think the microcosm of the world we live in is the fact that Tom Brady is both the greatest player of all time and the biggest cheater ever to walk right. the face of the earth. Right. So, and that's, and I mean, that's how this is going to be viewed in, in for, through the prism of fans is, I mean, Oh, there's the Patriots just cheating again uh, for other people. Like, look, I'm going to be forgiving towards the Patriots because I like I, I'm impressed by what they built over the course of time. Right. It's not that they win all the time. It's just how they go about doing business. But this is obviously an idiotic move on their part. It it puts a it, it tears a hole in that fabric of, of wow, they were on top of everything. Mm -hmm. Right. It's, and it's just such a stupid thing. My guess is it probably was an innocent small thing. If you look at the, you know, the totality of the evidence, you could easily come to that conclusion. If you look at the narrow bands of evidence, oh, wow, there's eight minutes of sideline tape. Ah, why would they have that? Well, because they probably shoot 20 hours of stuff. And I mean, so look, but that's the thing. I mean, it, it doesn't really matter what the story is or what the facts are at this point. It's just whether you want to buy into it, they're cheating. Well, probably you're going to think they're cheating. If you love the Patriots, they can do no wrong. Here's how I look at it, Bob. Because um, we create a lot of this stuff ourselves, right? Like mm -hmm. my wonderful wife, Kate, likes to watch. We like to watch shows um, where people go and investigate haunted places. And a lot of them are a waste of time. But there's one that was really interesting. It was this guy, Robert Joe. I think it's on, it's called I Wouldn't Go In There. And he goes to Asia, actually. And he goes to all these places that, that where people tell stories about why this place, that this place is haunted. But then, of course, always there's some actual terrible event that happened, right? Like our belief about places being haunted and ghosts is really just a sense of this idea that when these terrible things happen, it leaves a ripple or, right. or some sort of scar or something that we can detect. And there's always something terrible, political prisoners being executed or some terrible like mental hospital thing or something like that uh, it, underneath this, I mean, he even had members of the U.S. military like admitting that, well, we tore this house down because people said it was haunted and things like that, which was like pretty wild. And I think that we, with our minds, help create things in some ways that tips the scale and becomes real if mm -hmm. enough of us, you know, Ghostbusters or whatever. There's a lot of different ways that we can go with this believing and seeing. And with the Patriots... Because they were seen as cheaters, it actually was to their advantage. And I often opine that Bill Belichick is doing something brilliant, even if it's unintentional, by not really even acknowledging it. Because then every time you get a bounce against you, every time something goes against you in a game against the Patriots, you're like, they're, they're something, they're cheating, they just are cheating. And it creates a mental block for you, for the team that's trying to beat them, right. because you feel like they must have some unfair advantage, right? Like the wrestler pulling the foreign object out of his trunks, right? right. And you're thinking the whole wrestling match, he eventually, I'm going to get him, but then he's going to hit me with the chair and the ref's going to be like talking to his tag team partner. You know what I'm saying? So that's how it used to be. But now they're just pathetic, right? Because it's the Bengals. Right. So whether it's true or not, we flipped the narrative, Bob. That they're flailing. And this is me again building my own thing because I'm just deciding to, I want to feel this way. That, you know, when they kick the field goal before halftime against Lamar Jackson, they're losing their edge. 
You know, yeah. when Tom Brady says, we're doing the best we can. Because Tom Brady always struck me as someone as one of those, like, I don't accept anything less than perfection from myself or the people around me. And he's out there saying, well, we're just doing the best we can. And I feel like this is just another thing, true or imagined, that if they are trying to do espionage to figure out Zach Taylor's signals in his first year uh, with a one-win team, that they, that's that they're grasping at straws. And if anything, this gives the Bengals a ton of incentive to play this game like it's their Super Bowl this week. Good luck with that, Bengals. Um, I know. <laughs> uh, so, but I mean, look, there are, there are things that you know we can point to that are that are, that are tangible things. The, the lack of Rob Gronkowski, the lack of James Devlin, all uh, adding to sure. the inability to run the football, the injuries on the offensive line, Isaiah Wynn, etc., that have been issues all season long. That you know we we look past because it's Brady. He's not Brady. Uh, Belichick is not Belichick. Well, there's a, you know, everything is a thousand pieces all put into right. a puzzle. And if you remove well, a few of them, the whole thing can tumble. There's a game that kids play like that, I think, or even adults play. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so, so yeah, I get, you know, I get the whole, I mean, I get why people are going to glom onto this and, and, and make, make run with it. But I think there are more, more simple explanations for that, that for what's going on here if we want to pay attention to them. Yeah, and the NFL is going to accept the Patriots' explanation and try to get us just to stop talking about this. And the Patriots are going to go down at some point in the playoffs, maybe not in even the AFC Championship, and we won't be prematurely – because you said Gronk. I mean, that's the most important thing if we're going to not get into mis, mystique. I mean, just talk about not having Rob Gronkowski. We just got a couple minutes, like three minutes left, Bob. It's the holidays. Um, the Luminarias in Old Town. I'll always remember that, Bob. I always right. remember that. Albuqu no joke, folks out there. Luminarias in Old Town is one of the most beautiful Christmas scenes anywhere in the country, anywhere in the world. What do the holidays mean to you, Bob? Uh, football. Nice. Yeah, uh, that's why we're here. Right. It's why we gathered here today. I've been doing this for, what, 26 years now? Mm -hmm. And uh, my Thanksgivings is and Christmases uh, have been spent working for all those years. Uh, you know, thanks to my family and uh, the people around me who are very understanding of my addiction to the thing I do, the football and and the work that I love doing. And, uh, you know, we kind of touched on that earlier. Look, it's, you know, it's there's, uh, you know, on the list of things that I have done in my life, this is so far in the 100 percent awesome range that uh it's not even close so uh i think that when i'm sitting here working i'm thinking of how lucky i am to have this job and to have people out there who are willing to put up with my uh my nonsense uh and propagate it and i think you know something you said is you know when we get to sit here and, and just talk about the game and and you know let people take away the pieces that they want I think that's kind of how I've tried to do this job for those 26 years. I want to give everyone all the information they need to make really good decisions. And, and I get the part of that is going to be the clap back when the decisions don't work out well, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. I mean, and I'm fine with that and I'm fine because I do it too. Right. And so uh, I just think as I hit the holidays, I, I often think of how fortunate I am to be able to sit around working in business with uh, fantastic people. I mean, I love everyone that I get to work around and I get to associate with. So I don't know. I feel like, uh, uh, is there a line? I'm like the luckiest man alive uh, yeah. to be where I'm at, regardless of the circumstances or the time of the year. But uh, it's uh, it, it hits home a little more in the holidays. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, feeling grateful. Gratitude is its own reward. You always radiate with the inner light, Bob. And I wanted to add to my business card, like professional scapegoat. Like we could all use a scapegoat in our lives. Somebody should I'll be like scapegoat for, scapegoat for hire. Right. So like, like every every time when I'm sitting there and I'm answering tw Twitter questions on Saturdays. So, again, if you're asking me Twitter questions, I'll answer on Saturday. Back off a little bit. But <laughs> <laughs> but um, but I know, you know, I know that I want to give the nuance. I know they don't all want nuance. So the first word of my every reply is the answer. And then I try to add a sentence or two sure. of nuance because I think the nuance is important and it matters. But I know not everyone wants it. So you're trying to deliver for that wide range of people. And you know you're setting yourself up for failure because predicting the future is tricky business. Ask anyone who's ever tricked predicting the future, not named Nostradamus. It right. just doesn't always work out well. So, I mean, and again, I'm fine with all of that. And I enjoy it immensely. I enjoy the interaction with the people. Uh, and even if not everyone wants the nuance that I want to deliver, 
I'm okay with that because I delivered anyway. Yes, and we're and it means we get to talk to each other and everybody else in our community. Thank you, folks, for this opportunity. Gratitude. Uh, we talked about this before we went on the air. So gratitude to all of you, fantasy football community. And I'll leave you with one parting shot from Charles Bukowski. Bob, cats tell me without effort all that there is to know. Stay classy, everybody. <laughs>